turn in our Bibles this morning to uh, Philemon. I used to call it Philemon, but Philemon. And uh, it's an interesting story. I was reminiscing this morning thinking when I think of a runaway slave, I usually think of the 1800s, right? 16, 17, 1800s. No, there were runaway slaves back 2,000 years ago because there were a lot of slaves in the Roman Empire. So Paul is writing to a, a man named Philemon, who was a slave owner, around the year 64 A.D. So that's how long slaves have been around from before that. Paul's in Rome, Philemon's in Colossae, and he's interceding for a slave named Onesimus. Um, So Paul's letter is dictated to Onesimus, and then Onesimus and Tychicus will learn in the two guys here, will take this letter and carry it to uh, Philemon. Now, these two also carried the the uh, letter to the Colossians. They may have done it at the same time, but uh, both Tychicus, interesting Greek names, and, and Onesimus are mentioned in Colossians uh, 4, verses 7 through 9 in the notes. It says, all, all my state shall Tychicus declare to you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and servant in the Lord, whom I have sent to you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known to you all things which are done. So Philemon here, as I said, he's in Colossae. Paul's in Rome. He's a prisoner of Rome. He, he had some freedom to move about. In Acts 28, Paul speaks of this, says, Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. And what was he doing? Preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Nobody got in his way for that. Now, as far as Philemon and uh, Onesimus here are concerned, uh, the details aren't clear, but it does appear that Onesimus robbed something from his owner, Philemon, who was a friend of Paul's, or still is a friend of Paul's, and then he ran off to Rome, you know, a very populated city, hoping to just kind of blend into the crowd. But God had another plan. Who does he run into in Rome? Paul. What do you think Paul did? Shared the gospel with him. So, yeah, and uh, Onesimus gets saved now he's a brother in Christ to both Paul and to Philemon. And oftentimes, you know, we all make our plans, but oftentimes our plans don't go as planned. Uh, we can make our best plans and try to carry them out in our own understanding, in our own strength, or we can make careful plans and ask that God would bless our plans. Or we can begin by going to the Lord and asking what his plans are <laughs> and offer ourselves to carry out his plans and his purposes. So Onesimus here has stolen, run away, and gotten saved. But now what? He's with Paul. What should he do? Should he stay with Paul? I mean, Paul needed help. Paul's getting old. Should he return to Philemon? He's still officially a slave of Philemon. And what if he did return? The law says that a master can execute a rebellious slave. That's what justice was. But Philemon now is a Christian. I'm sorry, Onesimus is now a Christian. So will Philemon extend mercy to him? At this time, there were about 60 million slaves in Rome. Well, in the Roman Empire. And actually, the, the Romans feared a slave uprising because if they were to ever get organized... Uh, it could be a real problem for Rome. And so they had some very strict rules on how to deal properly with slaves so that this uprising didn't happen. And, and some slaves, there's a wide range of prices for slaves. Some could be sold for as much as 50,000 denarii. Then a denarii is one day's pay. I divided uh, 50,000 by 365 days a year, and it comes out to about 130 days, 130 years of pay, okay? Some. Doesn't mean uh, uh, Onesimus was that valuable, but it could be. Which in today's world is around 6 to $10 million, somewhere around there. 
So here, if he goes back to Philemon and Philemon forgives Onesimus, would other slaves run away uh, thinking that they would be dealt with mercifully? And what would the other masters think? There's a real problem. If he punished him, he's punishing a brother in Christ now. And how, how would this be a witness to others? And Paul's kind of in a dilemma. And so he's writing an, a letter now to Philemon. And uh, verse 1, Paul speaks of his love. And he says, Paul, a prisoner. Now, he doesn't say a prisoner of Rome. He says, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And Timothy, our brother, to Philemon our be dearly beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that is in thy house, grace to you, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul's writing to a friend on behalf of a runaway slave who is now his friend. Well, consider this, Paul's a slave, He's a prisoner in Rome uh, uh, of the Roman government, but he doesn't consider himself a prisoner of Rome. He considers himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ, willingly. But most slaves aren't willingly slaves. But he's greeting the household of Philemon, Aphia, perhaps the wife of Philemon, Archippus, perhaps his son. This is all speculating from the commentators, okay? Oh, and we learned that the church in Colossae met in Philemon's home. So he has a house church there, a home Bible study. And Paul writes to Aphia, who, as Philemon's wife, had the day-to-day -day, uh, responsibility for the slaves, according to the customs of that day. Now, the early church had no property of its own. They didn't own church buildings. But they met in the homes of the members, and they would move from house to house. The Jews had their synagogues, but, uh, you know, the the early Christians would move from house to house, gathering together in different home churches, sometimes having a, a city bishop or an overseer overseeing the different home churches. So Paul's also mentioned the, the house churches in Romans. In Romans 16:5, he says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Colossians 4.15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church which is in his house. So Philemon, this letter of Philemon is a personal note from Paul to Philemon. Unlike the general epistles, the general epistles are written really to the whole general body of Christ. Still, there's much that the Holy Spirit can show us in these, in these verses, only 25 verses here. Now, first we see Paul's thankfulness here in verse 4. I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers. So, Paul didn't always pray long prayers for Philemon, but he did often make mention of Philemon in his prayers. And interceding for others in prayer is important, but it doesn't need to be long. If you're, if you're short of words, one of my favorite prayers is, Lord, you know, help. <laughs> Okay, yeah, you know, you know their situation, my situation. Help, help me by your will, by your Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1.15 says, After I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love of the, all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 2, it should be in the notes. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And it's important to be thankful. Story goes that a, a man went to a rabbi, a Jewish man went to a rabbi and complained, life is unbearable. There are nine of us living in one room. What can I do? I'm so sick of this. And the, room, and the rabbi says, well, take a goat into the room with you. He says, what? Take a goat into the room with you. Well, he's skeptical, but the rabbi insists, do as I say and come back in a week. So he came back in a week and he looked even more distraught than ever. He says, I can't stand it. This goat is filthy. And the rabbi says, go home and let the goat out and come back in a week. He comes back in a week and the man is smiling. And he's saying, life is beautiful. We enjoy every minute of it now that the, there is no goat. Only the nine of us. <laughs> so I think it's a good example of how we need to be thankful in what we do have. <laughs> so verse 5, let's read through to verse 7. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus 
and toward all saints, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in thy love, because the, the, the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. So he prays that his friend would have a deep understanding of all that he had in Christ. The more we know Jesus, the more we get to know him in his word, and the more we experience his blessings, the more we get to share those blessings with others. Think about it. It's, it's easier to give out of abundance. And when we're abundantly filled with the love of Christ, it's easier to give out. If you have lots of anything, it's a lot easier. And in fact, we're often more willing to give when we have lots of it. I happen to like to eat chocolate at least a little bit of chocolate at the end of a meal. Even a candy kiss is enough. A few chocolate chips or those little Hershey kisses wrapped in foil. If I go to the cupboard and I find a bowl of them, I feel very generous. Pass them out. But if there's only one, my flesh says, there's only one, eat it. The spirit says, give it to your bride. <laughs> okay. When the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, according to Romans 5, 5, pouring out, spilling out, it's because we've experienced the love of God who first loved us. And we should have that fullness that when our cup of love is spilling over, as the idea in verse, uh, the Psalm 23 speaks of that, sharing out of abundance of love. When we have God's love, it's directed first to him, because it's coming from him, and then to others. And you can't say, I love God, but I can't stand the people. <laughs> okay, I've heard people say that. If God's love is in our hearts, we will love his people. That's all there is to it. If we don't love his people, we don't have God's love in our heart. That's a real conviction. There is a difference between love and like, too, by the way. The Bible does say, as, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all. Um, when we're trying to love people with our own kind of love it's not enough it's not good enough it's not big enough when we're doing that we need to repent and ask the lord to fill us with his love our effect on others the way we touch others hearts is not because of something that's great in us it's when others see in us a life that has been changed because christ has come into us and touched our lives and changed our lives and we are changed by god and that flows over that overflowing with God's love and it touches and influences people. Not because we're righteous within ourselves, not because we're able to show God's love in our own strength, you know, like a cheerleader cheering it up, but because he's righteous and just, he is gracious to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. John 1, 1 John 1, 9. We can be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, that's Second Timothy 2.1. We just went through Timothy recently. Paul had seen Philemon's love in action. He touched many lives. God's love in and through you can touch many lives. We all go out into the community and we touch lives. Verse 8, we look at Philemon's character. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, or another way to say it, or I command you to do what is right, <coughs> Yet for love's sake, I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. And uh, this word age is presbytos. It, it just means an aged man, an ambassador. But again, Paul doesn't consider himself a prisoner of Rome, of his circumstances. He's not a, a, a prisoner of the religious leaders in that day. He's the prisoner and the slave of Christ, doing the will of his master. Verse 10, and then he talks about Onesimus' conversion here. I beseech thee for my son, not biological, but son in Christ, Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. So Paul speaking of Philemon, Philemon on behalf of Onesimus, Onesimus, an escaped slave, Belonging to Philemon, meeting Paul in Rome, receiving Christ uh, through Paul's witness while Paul's in jail. He says in verse 10, whom I have begotten while in my chains or in my bonds. Uh, Roman law did allow escaped slaves to seek sanctuary with a family. But then the head, head of that family was obligated to give the slave protection while trying to persuade him to return to his master. 
If he thought his master was too cruel and just receive, refused to do that, he could be sold at auction, take his chances with a new master, and then the money that was paid for him would go back to his old master. Something's reasonable. So Onesimus, since Paul knew him and he's gotten to save now, has been a blessing to Paul, helping Paul out during his physical prison time in, in Rome. And Paul would like Onesimus to stay with him, but he left it up to Philemon. As he said, Onesimus was unprofitable to Philemon, no longer with him, has run away from him, but now made profitable both to Paul and Philemon. Actually, the word Onesimus, it means profitable, interesting name, but can now, he can now live up to his name. Paul, when he wrote the book of Romans in verse chapter 6, verse 22, said, but now being made free from sin and become servants of God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. In Christ, a useless person can be made useful, useful for the things of God. And that's just what Paul is uh, telling Philemon about Onesimus. Verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, I'm rereading 10 and 11, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I would have kept with me, that on your behalf he might have ministered to me in the bonds for the gospel. But without your consent, I would do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. So Paul is about to send Onesimus, he's sending Onesimus back to Philemon, hoping Philemon will release him, just let him go so he can return again to Paul, because Paul could use him. He's asking Paul to receive him just as if he were receiving Paul. <laughs> That's going to take a supernatural love, considering the circumstances here. He paid money for him, he ran away, probably stole something. And Paul's admitting he'd like to keep Onesimus because he's old, he's in prison, he's getting sick, he's cold. Onesimus could be a great help. And he says, and Paul's basically saying, I'd like to keep him. I'm just letting you know where he is. But I know it wouldn't be right to just keep him, but I thought about it. And if you send him back, that's going to be okay too. <laughs> that's, uh, did Onesimus send, uh, I'm sorry, did Philemon send Onesimus back to Paul? Well, we don't really know. We think he might have returning the stuff for Paul, but we don't know that. It doesn't say. And again, the law against runaways was really strict. When the runaway slave was captured, he could be crucified. Or sometimes they would brand them in their forehead with a, an F, which stood for fugam, which is a Latin word for fugitive. So Paul is just trusting that Philemon will do with Onesimus what is right in love before the Lord. And Paul's not speaking directly against slavery here. He's not trying to tear down the social structure of slavery. Instead, he lays down some principles that can get into the heart and to the mind that can profoundly affect how people deal with slavery. Because slavery really has gotten rid of when you deal with people's hearts and they realize what a, a curse to mankind it is. Verse 15 we see God's sovereign hand in verses 15 and 16. He says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that you should receive him forever. But now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Uh, their relationship is different. Onesimus is a slave and a believer. Philemon is a master and a believer, a mass slave master. Now they're both brothers in Christ. And a slave and owner under Roman law, but brothers in Christ under God's grace and salvation. And when a slave and an owner see one another as brothers, how long can slavery survive, really? Philemon left for Rome a slave, would return to Colossae a brother, as Paul intercedes, asking Philemon's forgiveness. But Philemon's in a tough place, too. It's, it's, if he's too easy on Onesimus, other slaves might just call themselves Christians just to influence their masters or to gain a softer punishment, possibly. Well, we, we don't know uh, what happened. In verse 17, he says, If you count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself, or receive him the same way that you would me. If, if he's wronged you or owes you, put that on my account. 
I, Paul, have written it with my own hand, I will repay it. Albeit, I do not say to thee how you owe me even your own self besides. So Paul is offering the perfect solution here. A, a costly solution says, I'll pay you, Philemon. I'll pay you for Onesimus. I'll, I'll pay you the slave's price. We have God's sovereign hand inter- interceding for Onesimus to pay the debt to his master, just as Jesus did for us, for all believers, really, in him. So Paul, he makes a personal promise here to restore Onesimus, to restore what Onesimus also owes to Philemon. He, he didn't say, well, here, here he is, it's not my debt. He says, I'll pay it, I'll pay it. I mean, how many of us would go to a bank and say, you know that overdraft on those people's account over there, $50,000 or whatever it is? Take that money out of my account and pay it. That's, I mean, I'm speaking theoretically because I've never had it in my account before, but, it, you know, I can speak of it as if. Then Paul asked Philemon to treat his slave as if as he would treat Paul himself. And it's interesting, in verse 9, Paul is essentially telling Onesimus, you know, I, I didn't want to say anything, but you do owe me. Reminding him that Paul had led him to Christ. And the greatest thing that he has right now is Christ in his heart. So he says, put that wrong on my account. When he did this, he, does, he, he did what Jesus does for us. He puts our sins on his account and then went to the cross and paid for it. To all, to Christ, all of us as believers are kind of his anesimuses, <laughs> putting our sins on his account. Some of us maybe would prefer that he'd wipe out our dollar debt. Or would you just pay off that other account too, you know, take all my credit cards? But what he's done is he's wiped out a debt that can only be paid with blood. Isn't that interesting? Christ paid it. He paid our debt, but that can only be paid in blood. Hebrews, I think it's in the notes. Hebrews 9.22 says, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. That means no, no forgiveness till blood is shed. Matthew 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission or the forgiveness of sins. Jesus paid an account that can't be paid any other way than the shed blood of the perfect sacrificial lamb. In fact, in John 1, 29, John the Baptist is staying there and he sees Jesus. He said, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 20, I'm getting near the end here. Paul's expressing a confidence in Philemon, in verse 20 through 22. Yea, brother, let me have joy of you in the Lord. Refresh my bowels, meaning the, the emotional heart within us. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I wrote to you, <clears throat> knowing that you will also do more than I say. But with all, or, or meanwhile, prepare me also a lodging. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be given to you. So, first, as I mentioned, verse 20, the bowels are the, the seat of our emotions. You know, it doesn't really mean our digestive tract in this world. Our tender affections, our compassion, our heart. But Paul has a relationship with Philemon, and he has the freedom to ask for lodging. You know, when I come there, can I stay with you? He's also confident that Philemon will treat Onesimus kindly, that he'll deal with him in love. He knows who he's dealing with. And think about it. Somebody who's been staying with you for a long time, steals from you and runs away, would your first feeling be love and grace? Love and grace. <laughs> Not necessarily. Now, Paul, in closing here, 23 through 25, there salute thee Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, by the way, Lucas, that's Luke, Dr. Luke, who wrote the Gospel of Luke in the book of Acts. My fellow laborers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your spirit. Amen. So Paul's closing his letter now with a personal touch, mentioning friends. Epaphras, probably pastor of a church, has gone to Rome to help Paul. John Mark. John Mark was uh, Barnabas's nephew, and he, he failed on his first missionary journey because he, uh, he left Paul and went home. Paul forgave him and restored him later. 
Aristarchus was from Thessalonica, and he, he accompanied Paul uh, to Jerusalem and then to Rome. Demas. Demas is interesting. He's mentioned three different times by Paul. Uh, it's not in the notes, but in Philippians 24, or Philemon 24, he said, my fellow worker. In Colossians 4.14, it says that he was traveling with Paul. And then in, in 2 Timothy 4.10, the last letter that Paul wrote, he said, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. So John Mark, he, he, he failed and was restored. Demas was doing well, but then he fell away. Dr. Luke, he's the beloved physician, uh, traveled with Paul and ministered to him, wrote the Gospel of Luke, as I said, in the book of Acts. But through all this, Paul's not calling for the overthrow of slave, slavery. Social change comes when the hearts of people are changed, one heart at a time very often. Bigotry, racism, low regard for the unborn, can't be cured by laws, good start, but the hearts of the people must change. Onesimus had to return to his master. When, when we do something wrong, we need to set it right, accept the consequences. And that's what Paul is saying to uh, Onesimus here. Being new creations in Christ certainly increases our responsibility to one another and society in general. I, I know uh, my perception of the world around me radically changed when I got saved and the Holy Spirit came in and I started reading through the Bible and, and seeing the world through the lens of God's Word. When we're directed by the Spirit of God, everything changes. God saves sinners. Not because we're so great, but because He's so graceful. <laughs> and grace is love that pays a price. Ephesians 1.6 says that we're accepted in the Beloved. And that we have clothes of righteousness, robes of righteousness. And uh, God receives us when we come to him in Christ Jesus. Let's close there. And I want to, would you turn to 1 John chapter 1? Uh, let's see, how are we doing? 1, 2, 3, 4. Bill's, Bill's got his thumb up there. That means it's good. So you can turn to 1 John chapter 1 or you can uh, read it off the uh the extra notes there. Because Jesus, when he was in the upper room, said, do this in remembrance of me. And uh, Chuck will be handing out the elements now. We each get one, right? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but God is. <laughs> so, you know, we, we have the word of God that we can learn of Jesus. I've seen a lot of pictures of Jesus. He usually has blonde hair and blue eyes. Jews are olive-skinned and black hair for the most part. So there are no pictures of him. I've seen stainless, stained glass pictures of him, so we really don't know. We know of him. We know a great deal of him. Because we have his book, his story. His story is his story. But John, this is the Apostle John, who was probably, they estimate, 17, 18, when he was walking with Jesus. He touched him. He talked to him. He, his head was on it. It says that he would lay his head on Christ's chest sometimes. I mean, you know, that kind of affection, <clears throat> you don't usually see guys. We'll occasionally hug each other. Um, but uh, to lay your head on somebody's breast like John would do, it was an affection that was appropriate in those days. Thank you. We have one for each. Awesome. So I just want to read the the perception that John has, the Apostle John, that which was from the beginning. The Bible starts out in the beginning. But we're talking about Jesus, the man, that which was from the beginning. He was from the beginning. He, if In order to be there at the beginning, you have to have been there before the beginning because in the beginning God created. So he's talking about this person, this God-man who was there from the beginning which we have heard. They followed him around. They were with him. They heard him speak. They know the, tim the timber of his voice. They know what he sounded like. They've listened to him. We, he says, we've seen him with our eyes. They looked upon him. God incarnate flesh. You know, God who came into this time zone 2,000 years ago and put skin on for 33 years so that he could go to the cross. You might wonder, why did he come as a man? Well, you can't crucify a spiritual God, and he needed to shed his blood. 
So he came as a man, a blood-filled man, so he could shed his blood to, to take care of all the sins. We've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon, and our hands have handled, they touched him, they hugged him of the word of life. For the life was manifested, came into being, and we have seen it. And bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. He's saying, this is, this is a big deal here, because he was outside of time, he stepped into time, then he stepped back out of time again, and he gave us that promise that we will one day go with him. We'll be stepping out of time also. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard, we declare unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, or with his Son, Jesus Christ. <coughs> and these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. We want to we wanna tell you about this so there's no question about what we're talking about. So you can have that joy that comes from knowing who God is. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Not just the creator of light, he is light. Now, what does that mean? I'm not sure what the fullness of all that means. But we will know when we're in his presence. But he did give us Jesus to look upon, and John's talking about this here. Now, if he's light and there's no darkness in him, verse 6 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie about that fellowship. We're not, we do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Pretty simple. If we say we have no sin, I've asked people, have you ever sinned? No, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> You're a liar. <laughs> Sorry to be so blunt. <laughs> if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So that's something to pray for someone who thinks they don't sin is that the truth would come in them. And I love this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him, God, a liar, and his word is not in us. So you can't put dark and light in the same place. They can't live together. And uh, he's making an illustration here that we see in the physical world. When you turn all the lights out, it's darkness. Darkness is the absence of light. And we want his word in us. So when Jesus was in the upper room with his apostles, he said, do this in remembrance of me. So in remembrance of who he is that John's just explained here, we have the cups. Now, if you just bend down the first the lip, it'll reveal the top one. You can peel back and it uh, gives us the representation of the body of Christ. Let's partake together of that body, that representation of the body that went to the cross for our sins. And then the lower side, peeling that back, be careful, especially if you're wearing white. Jesus said, this is the blood of the, represents the blood of the new covenant, the new testament. No longer the shedding of animals, but the shedding once of the perfect sacrificial lamb on the cross for our sins. Let's partake together of that representation of Christ's blood. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful, that you are just, that you forgive, and you cleanse. Oh, that your word could go out to the whole world, Lord, and I know it has, but many are deceived. Many are still walking in darkness and think they have a light. Lord, open their eyes. When we have opportunity, please give us the ability to come into their presence and share that gift of salvation through faith in Christ with them, Lord. Oh, Lord, your will be done. We need you desperately, Lord. Be with us this day, in Jesus' name, amen.